all say together the bold italic print. And I will say the other parts. Our Father in heaven, O Lord, you are not just the creator who condescended to your creation or the potter who purposed his clay. You are a father with a family, our father, Abba Father, formal and familiar. Together as siblings, we are your sons, brothers and sisters through Christ in relationship with you together. That you are near to us and that we have been adopted into your family blows our minds and we thank you. O oh Lord above in the heights of heaven, that we have your ear when we pray, that you should want to listen to us is beyond our understanding. That the sin-induced void between God and man has been vanquished as a result of the cross is good news indeed. Though you are far above us, yet you hear our hearts poured out to you, and we thank you. Hallowed be your name. O oh Lord, yours is the name above all names. In time and eternity, it is without equal. It is the name to which every knee must bow and every tongue confess. Help us to meditate on your many monikers. God, Lord God, Lord Almighty, Lord of hosts, God of peace, far and farther. May knowing you more through your many names be our lifelong preoccupation. That you reveal to us who you are through your many names. We thank you. Your kingdom come. Through us, your one holy, universal and mission-focused church. Broadcast your fame to the north, south, east and west. Extend your reign, O God. Through us, teach the truth. Share the gospel. Bring sinners to repentance, heal the brokenhearted, and push back every counterfeit kingdom that dwells in men's hearts. Help them, help us to seek first your kingdom. Today especially, we pray for the children's church leaders. We are grateful that they have responded to this high calling with, here I am, Lord. May your excellence be their inspiration. May their proclamation of your name cast an unquenchable zeal for your glory in our kids' hearts. That you have commissioned and equipped them as co-workers with Christ. We thank you. Amen. Hello, our reading today is from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14 to 24. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast on what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning and um, welcome to St. James this morning. 
It's uh, good seeing you. It's good having you with us. It's amazing that when the children leave, it's got a few seats that are open, isn't it? We are family church, and, uh, and this is so good that our families can come, and there's a special place for our children to go to. So thank you. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for praying for the Sunday school teachers. Um, your prayers are highly coveted. Um, your children are so important to us that we want to minister to them the best we can from God's Word. We are continuing our series um, in uh, God's Attributes. And this morning we're going to look at God's faithfulness in sanctifying us. God's faithfulness in sanctification. But before I go there, um, I have been asked by Rox to just mention one thing to you. If you are keen on reading to your children, and if you want to read a really good book, a really good series, um, probably from ages 7 upwards, there's a book or a series called The Wing Feather Saga. It's brilliant. They're actually going to put it into a series now as well, a, a, a video series. And there's one full copy currently avail available at Bargain Books. So after the service, after <laughs> tea, if Bargain Books are open, I'm not sure, rush there and fight for it and try and get it, or get it and share it with as many as possible. Right. Um, I thought of starting this morning by telling you a little bit about um, something that happened in my life some time ago. But it's something that has been happening all through my life. So uh, as a young Christian, I joined an outreach group that um, sought to minister to people in need in the inner city of Cape Town. And one of our outreaches was a Friday night outreach from 11 o'clock p.m. till 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock a.m in the morning, where everybody's out in the streets, at the nightclubs, etc. So, and, and our focus was the nightclubs, um, the women in prostitution, the pimps, the men in prostitution, and um, basically everybody that's on the street. Um, during that time, we focused on, and we sought to reach out to them and share the gospel with them, build friendships with them, etc. And I remember, remember the one time, I'm a small guy, <laughs> so uh, the one time we went to this one nightclub, and with me was this, this very petite young girl. And the two, two of us went to this one night club and one of the bouncers were standing in front of us. And it's this massive Nigerian guy. And it was probably a second time I re reached out and I was wondering, right, I need to tell you about Jesus. How are you going to respond to us? This little petite girl and this little small guy. And I just hesitated. Um, and I said to this little girl, she's like, what are we supposed to do? I'm not sure exactly what it means. We've gone through all the training and everything, but yeah, I'm standing in front of this big Nigerian. And she said, well, I'll tell you what, just follow me. I'm like, let me follow you. You're this fine little girl. I follow her. And she just started talking to this man, massive guy. Um, wonderful conversation. At the end of the day, end of the conversation, she said, can I pray for you? And he said, yes, please pray for this and this and this and this and this. And I was amazed at how open the Lord made his heart and how bold he made us, well, her, <laughs> in approaching this, this man and talking to this guy and just sharing the gospel with him and praying for him. And, and we built a relationship with him. It's one of, the, one of the kind of guys, one of the group of guys that you would see on a regular basis are the bouncers. And we built a relationship with them. But one of the fa my favorite areas of reaching out on Friday nights was at, at the Seapoint Promenade where we would reach out to um, young boys, young men that were caught up in male prostitution. And um, many of them um, went to the city. They come from the Platteland. They come from places like Nelspread. They come from places like Bloemfontein and Kimberley, etc. And they go to the, into the city thinking they're going to make it. And they don't. And they fall on bad grounds. Uh, and they just uh, are caught up in this, this vicious cycle of drugs and prostitution, etc. And um, so my, my, that was one of the favorite areas where I wanted to reach out um, and where I enjoy reaching out, building a relationship, building significant relationship with these young men that we saw on a regular basis. Um, but for some reason, the leadership of our outreach organization has been sending me for the last couple of weeks to other areas in, in town, 
Um, and I didn't mind going there, but I really, really wanted to go there. And I just thought it was just really unfair of our leadership to keep on sending me to other areas in town and not to this place where I've been building significant relationships with some of these young men. So I'm frustrated, I'm irritated, and I'm thinking that this is just so unfair and all of this is building up within me. And one particular Friday, as I traveled um, on the train from Colt Bay to, our, uh, to the office and the place where we were staying and where the leadership were in Paro, I decided that I was going to confront the leadership and I was going to tell them how unfair this is and I'm going to ask them to please send me to the area that I most enjoy going to. I was basically just going to share my heart with them and confront them. As I came to the front door of the office building and of the commune where we were staying, as I was about to ring the bell for someone to open up with me, I noticed a small little piece of paper lying on the ground. And so I picked it up. And as I picked it up, I noticed that there was a verse written on this piece of paper. And it's the famous verse that many of us know. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him. And He will make your path straight. And God's Spirit at that moment convicted my heart convicted my heart and so when the door opened i greeted the lady went up to my room uh, fell down on my knees and i prayed in repentance thanking god for his word apologizing for my rebellious heart asking for forgiveness and submitting to his will for me See, that was a moment, a little vignette in my life of God at work in me, sanctifying me, making me more like Jesus, sanctifying me. Many such instances has taken place throughout my life, and I'm sure it has taken place in your life, where God is speaking to you, making you more like Jesus, sanctifying you. Sanctification. <laughs> I mean, what is it? What, what, is it what does it look like? What does it look like in real time? We get the theology. We get the truth. But what does it actually tangibly look like in our lives in real time? So I'm going to pray for us. And I'll ask the Lord's help as we consider this this morning. So please bow with me. We come before you, Lord God, humble, knowing that we are but human, that you're God, you're not like man, even though you came as man, perfect. You know us, you've been tempted. You know our struggles. You know our potentials. You know the work you can do, desire to do, and will do. So here we are. And we pray, Lord, do only the work that you can do in us. Sanctify us for your glory's sake, we pray. Help us to somehow get our heads a little bit around this. Help us to have some sort of understanding, some measure of understanding, and grow us in our knowledge of you, understanding of you, understanding of this particular aspect of your work. And help us to love you and love those around us in a manner that you want us to. For your glory's sake we pray. Amen. So what is sanctification? Well, sanctification is a process of heart and life and everyday active transformation, changing. I love that as the Bible lays out the truth of my salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, that it reminds me that I am forgiven. It reminds me that I am accepted. 
It reminds me that I am justified before God. I'm declared right before Him. So my identity and my position have been altered before God. I no longer have a wrong standing before Him, but I now have a right standing before Him through faith in the one who is right before God, Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. There is still the, act, this is still the actuality of my sin in my life and in your life. So God has declared me sanctified. He has declared me holy. But maybe my wife wouldn't think me as so holy. My kids wouldn't think of me as so holy as when I complain and when I curse Eskom or Mangwang municipality for the lack of electricity or for the lack of water in our lives, etc. And my fellow workers may not think of me as so holy. And the guy that I'm yelling at who's just stolen the parking space, which I was just re getting ready to go into, he may not think, or she may not think that I am so holy. Paul Tripp puts it this way. The Bible presents the theology of sanctifying grace. That although the power of sin has been broken, the presence of sin still remains and is being progressively eradicated in my life. Progressively eradicated in my life. You see, God is not satisfied with me to live in the actual condition of sin. Even though my legal standing has changed before Him, He is not satisfied with me to live in the actuality of my sin. It is like, you, you know, if you, if you send your child to swimming school classes. So you send him or her and they arrive and the swimming coach says, um, you have joined the swimming club. You are now a swimmer. You are, you've joined the swimming club. So jump into the pool and swim. <laughs> How's that going to pan out? Not, not very well. I mean, my, my child still have to be coached and be taught how to swim. They need to be taught, they need to be empowered, so that they can actually live as swimmers. I am a child of God. You are a child of God. But I'm not naturally just living as a child of God, because sin is still with me. And so God meets me with sanctifying, empowering grace. He, he uses the indwelling power of God's Spirit inside me to what? To convict me of sin. So what happens? Sin bothers you. Sin bothers me. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Conviction isn't judgment. Conviction is God lovingly drawing me nearer to Him. He uses His Word to move me, to get goals of grace set before me, to remind me of what I should love and what I should hate and what I should desire and how I should speak in this world and how I should live in this world. And He uses His church, you, the body of Christ, he uses his church with the teaching and the preaching of his word and the singing of truth, of hymns, and the communicating of truths in our life group and small groups and the interaction with one another. He uses that to move me along, to work in me. You know, there's a striking metaphor that just doesn't make sense in God's word. A word picture in the Old Testament that really gets at this. It's found in Isaiah 55. So let me read it to you, and we'll get to 1 Thessalonians 5 just now. Isaiah 55 verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and, and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word 
be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So what shall it accomplish that God purposed? What shall it succeed in? Verse 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills, the, the struggles of life, the big things of life, the overpowering things of life. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. You will have a different perspective. Things will look different. And all the trees of the field shall <coughs> clap their hands. Verse 13, instead of the thorn shall come up a cypress. Well, try and figure that one out in your head. Instead of the briar shall come up a myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. See, it's talking about the rain and the word coming down like water and snow. And it says instead of the thorn bush will be what? A cypress tree. Instead of the briar, it will be a myrtle. Now that's a word picture that makes no sense logically at all. Because, I mean, if I have a little thorn bush in my backyard and it is watered by the rain and by the snow, not here in Bloemfontein, I mean, I don't say to myself, well, if it keeps raining, this is going to become a cypress tree. <laughs> you don't say that to yourself. That doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous. It's incomprehensible. See, what this picture is showing us is that as God's, God works in our lives by His grace, we don't become bigger and we don't become better than what we are. We become fundamentally different than what we once were. Fundamentally different at the core of our being flowing out into and through our lives. In becoming something different by God's work of grace. Now, now God employs His means, right? His means of grace, if you will. I don't sanctify myself by, by reading the Word and but reading the word is important for me. But I don't sanctify myself. But reading the word is an important part of sanctification. Fellowship of the body of Christ is an important part of sanctification. But the body of Christ can't make me change. But it's an important part of sanctification that God uses. Doing everything I can to develop my biblical literacy and my theological understanding is part of God's tool of sanctification. Being humble and being approachable. So people who see things about me that I don't see about myself is part of God's sanctifying work in me. But sanctification is not my own human effort. Sanctification is God's grace working through everyday means that I give myself to to do what I would be unable to do for myself, transforming me from what I once was to what God wants me to be. His likeness. The likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. How faithful do you think God is and will be in sanctifying you? How faithful do you think He is in that? As much as God is committed to saving you, as much as God is committed to keeping you, as much as God is committed to bringing you into His heaven, so much so 
Is God committed in sanctifying you? Let me read to you again our text. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14 following. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and, and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, God's word, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Notice three things here. Exhortation, the prayer, and the promise. Exhortation. Paul, Paul has just finished giving a string of exhortations, commandments, verses 14 through to 22, which comes to an end in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Now, part of God's word comes to us in the form of exhortations. It comes to us in a form of commandments and incentives. And God uses them in the way that He sanctifies us. He does not say, well, I am the one who sanctifies you, so I have nothing to tell you. I've got nothing to say to you. He doesn't do that. The way He works in sanctifying us is not merely subconsciously. He deals with our minds and He deals with our motives by speaking to us, by bringing truth to us, by presenting His Word to us. That's the first thing to notice. The second thing is prayer. Verse 23, Paul moves from exhorting us to be holy to asking God to sanctify us, to transform us, to make us holy. Now, May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, completely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, not only does God use exhortations and commandments and incentives in the way that he sanctifies us, he also uses the prayers of those around us. Those who are sitting next to you. Your community, your life group, your friends who loves Jesus Christ. Who sees you, who sees your life. Who's praying for you, who's interceding for you. God uses that. It's not falling on deaf ears. See, He not only deals with your mind and your motives in the way that He transforms you and change you. He deals with the mind and the motives of others so that they will pray for you. Now, I've got a friend who would every now and again remind me that he's praying for me. I've got another friend. I receive a WhatsApp call, every no a WhatsApp notice every week saying, I'm praying for so-and-so in your family. I'm praying for you. I'm praying about this. Is there anything else I can pray for? This is what's on my heart. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. God uses that in the sanctification work of our lives. See, God allows and God permits, God gives others to you in your life. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing. So don't withhold yourself from that. Be humble. Be approachable. Go for it. Step into community. It's a blessing that God has given us. One another. Purpose. Oh, sorry, promise. Notice not only the exhortations and the prayer, but most important, the promise of God. See, after commanding us to pursue a sanctified, transformed life in verses 14 through to 22, and praying that God would sanctify us in verse 23, Paul says 
the decisive thing in verse 24. He who called you is faithful. He will do it. He's faithful. He will do it. See, there is a tremendous assurance in the fact that the work that God has started in you, He will see through to completion. Tremendous assurance in that. So let this truth, this trust, this faith, this assurance shape your thinking this morning about God's involvement in your life. You see, our reasoning at times says, well, okay, so... He is commanding us to abstain from evil. So it must be up to us to get holy. And therefore, it is not assured. Because I'm a failure. <laughs> I fail at times. So how sure can this be? Or our reasoning says, well, someone is praying for God to change me. So it depends on their prayer. And God may or may not answer their prayers. So how sure can this be? God's word is needed. Prayer is needed. But right thinking moves on from that to verse 24 and says God's faithfulness combined with God's call proves that he will do it. He will do it. He who calls me, calls you, is faithful and he will do it. Do what? The it is what Paul's been exhorting us to do and what he's been praying for. Our sanctification, your transformation, your changing, your holiness. God will do it. See, that is the foundation for full assurance in God who is at work in changing us. God, through the writing of His Word, says, I have called you. I am faithful. I will do it. See, the issue of assurance is, will I trust Him? Not only for the grace to forgive my sins, but also for the grace to make headway in overcoming my sins. Will I trust and believe that God who has called me is faithful and that He will do this? When will He do it? We're on a journey, aren't we? Now some of us here may be thinking, but does verse 23 and 24 not refer to that day when Jesus Christ returns? Looking at verse 23 especially, I can understand that you may be thinking that. When Paul prays that God would sanctify us and keep us blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, does he mean that God will change us then in a twinkling of an eye when Jesus comes? Or does he mean that he will work in us now so that we will be holy when Jesus comes? We will be presented before him. Are verse 23 and 24 a prayer and a promise for what God will do all at once, only when Jesus Christ returns? Or are they a prayer and a promise for what God will do now in the lives of believers to prepare them for that special day? The short answer is that it is a prayer and I promise for God to do what needs to be done now in your life. In preparing you for that day. That special day. Yes, we will be changed after Christ comes. And we will be like Him as we see Him. But there's this progressive transformation and changing that takes place in preparing us for that day. Not only does sanctification usually refers to the process of becoming holy, of changing now, but within this letter, 
that Paul writes, there is a parallel chapter, chapter 3 in 1 Thessalonians, where blameless, holiness, and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is used together as it's done in chapter 5. Look at chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, which gives us insight into what Paul means. Verse 12, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. So that's what Paul prays for in chapter 5, verse 23. Before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, same phrase used in chapter 5, verse 23, with all His saints. See, what Paul is praying is that God would do something now, namely, make us increase and abound in love. The goal of this progressive work in us now is that when the end comes, we might be established before God in holiness. Why? Because love is the essence of human holiness. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. Love one another. The two greatest commandments, all other commandments hang on these two. One Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24 really does teach that God is the one who sanctifies us now. Progressively through this journey, this beautiful journey that we're on with him. And he does it through his word that appeals to our minds and our hearts and our motives. He does it through your prayers for one another, our prayers for each other. But however he does it, and however slowly it comes, and however imperfect we feel, the main thing is that God does it, and that he will do it. That is the ground of our assurance in our sanctification. He who calls you is faithful, he will do it. It's as if Paul said, he called you. Don't you get it? Don't you see it? He called you. And if He called you, then He will sanctify you. That's what His faithfulness means. And you go, but why does the fact that He called me mean that He has to sanctify me? That He has to change me? Why does He have to change me? Why does He have to sanctify? Well, it's because His purpose in calling you was that you might become holy. Holiness is the purpose of God in your call. He, who, he, he would be unfaithful to His purpose if He just called you and don't sanctify and change you. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. In 1 Thessalonians. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. God called you with a holy calling. His purpose in calling you is your holiness. He will do it. He is faithful. Ephesians 1 verse 4. God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world get that my head doesn't get that my head spins around that but he did that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and that we might be blameless before him in love your holiness is as sure as God choosing you Romans 8 verse 29 those whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son Becoming like Jesus is as sure as God's call of you. As sure as He's choosing of you. As sure as He's saving you. The purpose of God in the death of His Son was to sanctify you. Sanctification. Ephesians 5 verse 26. Christ loved the church. You. Loved you. And gave Himself up for you. That He might sanctify you. 
set you apart, make you holy, transform you, change you more and more into His image and into His likeness. See, your sanctification is as sure as God's purpose in the death of His Son, Jesus. In choosing you, His purpose was your sanctification. In predestining you, His purpose was your sanctification. In dying for you, His purpose was your sanctification. In calling you, His purpose was your sanctification. He who called you is faithful. He will do it. He will sanctify you. He who chose you is faithful. He will do it. He who predestined you is faithful. He will do it. He who sent His Son to die for you. He is faithful. He will do it. It's a tremendous God we serve, don't we? He hasn't wound up the world to wound down by itself. He hasn't stepped in with special grace to save you and just leave you. He's a God who comes near, who steps into our mess <laughs> and works with us, making us beautiful into the image of Jesus Christ. He's faithful. He will do it. Let's thank Him. This is a tremendous truth, Lord. Sanctification. Thank you for your tremendous work in and around us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for community. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that you are our Father. Thank you for these eternal gifts that we can have now in this world looking forward to that day as we are progressively changed into the image and likeness of Jesus to meet him to be more like him thank you for this work in us thank you that you don't just let us be and leave us alone in our sin how awful that would be how terrible that would be Thank you that you at work in us, changing us. And helping us to be of help to others. Thank you. Lord, I pray, help us to trust you. Give us assurance from your word, your spirit working in us. Taking your word, the truth of your word, and molding it into our lives. Bringing faith, bringing assurance, bringing, bringing trust, bringing change, bringing transformation. We look up to you humbly and we bow the knee and say, Lord, we submit to you, your ways, for your glory's sake. And Lord, it's even for our good. We thank you. Amen. I ask the band to come up and we're going to stand together and sing our last song. So. Uh...